live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, all right. Hi, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Science Cafe here at the Museum of Natural Sciences in the Daily Planet Cafe. I am so excited to see all these fabulous people who have come out to do some cool, fun, sciencey stuff here at the museum tonight. I always say the coolest place you could be on a Thursday is right here in the Daily Planet Cafe doing some learning about some science. We do that every, every Thursday, 7 o'clock, right here in the Daily Planet Cafe. We bring in cool, interesting people doing really neat work, studying things or working in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, nature conservation. We bring them here on the stage and we give you all the chance to hear about what they do and ask your questions of them, right? We're bringing experts here into the museum so that you can meet them, interact with them, and ask your questions about the things that they're spending their 40 or more hours a week thinking about. And I think that's a pretty cool thing that we get to do, and I'm glad that we can do that right here in Raleigh. In fact, I think, last I checked, we have the only weekly science cafe around. So right here in the Triangle, you've got a really great opportunity to participate in some great science that's happening most often right here locally. Uh, tonight, we're going a little bit outside North Carolina for tonight's expert. We have Nathan Hazlip from the Turtle Survival Center, and that is near Charleston, South Carolina, so not too far in an OK Carolina. And oh, they didn't like that joke. OK. No, that's perfectly fine. And Tonight we're going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart, and that's endangered species, biodiversity. Right? Humans have had, you could say we've had a pretty negative impact on the planet when we think about endangered species, habitat loss, we've got climate change coming up. But these are all topics which humans are also doing their very best to try to fix. Right? So we've had an impact, but we also have great opportunities to make the world a better place, not just for us, but for all of the other living things that we share Earth with. And so I'm excited that tonight we get to hear from somebody who's really on the front lines doing that work for some really special animals. Who likes turtles? Who right now has like a dozen turtle gifs or gifs saved on your phone? You've already, yeah, there you are, I found you. Yeah, so we're going to talk about turtles tonight and endangered species. Um, also tonight, I want everybody to know we have an extra special treat for tonight's Science Cafe. In the house, we have living poetry. So we have a group of individuals who, during the talk, they will be writing poetry about tonight's topic as it happens. This is all happening live. They haven't written anything yet, and they're going to write it as we go. And then... After we do the audience Q&A section, they're going to come up on stage and actually share with us what they've written. So look forward to that as well. We should get some really cool stuff to share. It's going to be a great night. I hope you're ready for it. Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage the facilities manager and lead keeper for the Turtle Survival Center, Nathan Hayslip. All right, guys. Um, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, it's uh, a lot to live up to, what he kind of um, put me up to, so we'll see. Uh, I'll try to keep it a little uplifting tonight. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about fighting to save the world's most endangered turtles. Um, so if you look at vertebrates um, in kind of categories with um, primates, amphibians, birds, mammals, um, turtles are at the top of the list for being threatened. Um, if you look at the IEC and red list, you can see that... Um, they're over 50% of the species are threatened with either critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable status. Um, and so basically that means that these populations have decreased to the point to where they are nearing extinction. So um, what kind of triggered the creation of the Turtle Survival Alliance, what was termed the Asian Turtle Crisis? And so what, we happen, what happened was that we saw all these species um, kind of being showing up in um, the pet trade and, and, the, and the food trade in Asia. Everything was coming out of all these um, small countries and going to China. 
Um, so all these countries have very you know, endemic species, um, limited ranges, and, and we saw thousands of animals being vacuumed out of the wild. Um, and one reason was the food trade. Um, traditional Chinese medicine, as well as just consumption of these animals around the world, um, had their populations you know, already decreasing. And then the pet trade. Um, so it became a lot more common to have turtles. Um, you know, not, they're kind of a little more mainstream now as of 20 or 30 years ago. It's not as weird to have um, a turtle in your, uh, in your bedroom or whatever. So um, that came a little more common. And with that, um, people wanted to have these rarer species, um, species that were a little more colorful or charismatic. Um, and so what we had is, is these um, throwaway markets in China basically pop up. Um, which is a steady drain on wild populations. All these species here, um, just large markets full of turtles, uh, mostly adults and um, mostly endangered or critically endangered species. Um, so um, the TSA was formed, but we really asked, started asking questions of like, how long do they have at collection numbers like this? Um, how long do we have to save species? Um, like. For instance, Lonesome George here, um, who's now extinct. Um, and then the answer is not long enough. Um, so we formed the TSA to China fight all these different threats for um, turtle conservation. Um, and so we were born in 2001. We're uh, just an assemblage of everything um, turtle passion. Um, we have scientists, we have just private individuals, zookeepers university professors, everybody who's interested in turtles is kind of part of the Turtle Survival Alliance. Um, and in 2008, we became a 501c3. Um, and basically, our mission is committed to zero turtle extinctions. Um, and so we just try and do everything we can to help these turtles um, exist. So what does that mean we do? Uh, it's kind of still a little vague. So um, we try and engage the community wherever we work. So this is the future generation of turtle biologists, of conservationists, uh, people that are gonna really make a difference. Um, and so every place that we work around the world, we try and make sure that we're engaging these kids and, and kind of telling them the importance and showing them the importance of these animals that are in their backyards. Um, currently, we work with around 20 of the top 25 most endangered turtles. Um, some of that's through in-range countries. I'll tell, talk about that in a minute. Some of that through captive assurance colonies and a little bit of both. Um, so one of our biggest um, needs, that I guess, that was, was addressed immediately was um, response to confiscations. Um, so the confiscations have, happen around the world, not just in the United States and not just with you know, exotic parrots or, or tigers. Um, and so what we saw happening was um, these confiscations popping up around the world and nobody being there to help. Um, so you have a government organization with 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 tortoises, turtles, whatever, and nobody there to really even help you know, fix the problem. So I'll give an example um, in the Philippines. Um, there was this large confiscation of the Palawan forest turtle in 2015. Um, now, it's not an overly large confiscation of 3,800 animals. We, we've dealt with larger. Um, but the problem was for this species is that that's more than what we knew the entire population of the species existed. So we didn't know that there were 3,800 animals for the whole population. Uh, it only occurs on one small island. Um, and so potentially in that truck represents an entire species. Um, so what we did is we, we had people on the ground within, within 72 hours, basically. Um, partners from around the world um, responding to the chaos and basically creating order. Um, yeah, so here's some, some of the partners that kind of help pitch in and, and come together to save these turtles. Um, and it was a rapid response. We had three different continents involved uh, to help save these animals. Um, hundreds of people participated either directly, um, sending materials, funding. Um, and so it was a huge collaborative effort. Um, and it, it was something that transformed a, a terrible situation into something of uh, a positive, one of hope. You know, we really had um, thoughts that this was going to um, 
be a great endeavor. Um, and in fact, after five weeks of that confiscation, we released 99% of the animals, uh, which is a huge accomplishment because most of these animals, when they're confiscated, are in terrible condition. It takes a lot of rehab, uh, a lot of medical procedures and stuff. So um, after five weeks, 99% of those animals went back out in the wild, protected lands um, that are now being monitored, um, ongoing research with the population. So we're trying to take negative scenarios and turn them into, into positive things. Um, another confiscation I'll talk about is, is in April of 2018, um, we had um, 10,000, almost 11,000 tortoises found in one house. Um, so here's kind of the scenes that we saw, uh, just packed with tortoises. Um, and, and that was something that just, it was one huge, lump sum of tortoises to deal with. Um, and so we mobilized um, medical professionals, zookeepers, but also construction crew. We didn't have a place to put 10,000 tortoises at once. Um, and so we had to build facilities, build enclosures um, on top of getting all these animals um, basically better and, and, and ready to at least you know survive in captivity for a while until they can go back out in the wild. Um, and then in October, we get 7,000 more. Um, and I forgot to mention that we already had 7,000 in captivity um, from confiscations in the past. So we're currently housing 24,000 tortoises in captivity that are all confiscated. Um, and so now we're working on um, a reintroduction program with the government to um, put these animals back into protected lands where they need to go. Um, the problem right now in Madagascar is that there's limited protected lands. Um, so um, identifying you know, strategic areas and also um, making those areas more suitable for reintroductions, whether it be with further protection, um, with habitat improvements, et cetera, to try and get these animals back out on the wild where they need to go. Um, and so we have a lot of field programs abroad. We uh, work in eight Asian countries, as well as Madagascar, Europe, South America, and Africa. Um, and those field programs are focused on species that are critically endangered um, and have a captive component. Uh, they basically have a, a breeding program with that. Um, so the perfect example is our program in Myanmar with the Burmese star tortoise. Beautiful tortoise here. Um, in, in the 90s and early 2000s, it found, only found a handful of animals left in the wild. They were highly sought after for the pet trade. As you can see, they're, they're gorgeous and, and people really like to have them in their homes. Um, we confirmed that they were being still collected, but also villagers were consuming them. Um, and so in, the, in 2005, the species was actually declared functionally extinct. Um, that doesn't really sound like a, a, a great hopeful story yet. Um, so we started establishing assurance colonies ahead of this uh, with confiscated animals. Uh, we started with around 200 animals um, and we had secure facilities throughout Myanmar um, working with partners like the Mandalay Zoo and other places um, to ha build these populations. Um, and so we initially just provided help um, and, and improve the husbandry, um, but in 2008, we actually took over the husbandry um, instead of government officials being over it. Um, they hadn't been able to breed the animals for the past three years, and in 2008, um, we got 250 eggs alone. Uh, they had never gotten eggs at all, so that's a great sign. Um, and we continued facility improvements. Um, here's a, a, a facility improvement, just you know, more and more hatchlings produced. Um, we do a lot of um, community outreach, you know, improvements. We built schools and other things, getting the kids involved, um, trying to bring in the entire community. Uh, they do, did a World Turtle Day to kind of raise awareness about um, turtles and what's going on. Um, and we, then we released the animals back into the wild. So we've started a reintroduction program now with our offspring. Um, they go through some health screenings. Um, some are radio transmitted for more data and, and, and research. Um, they're notched to um, individually ID them. But they also get this tattoo. You can kind of see it in the middle here. Um, it's basically just a, a set of circles. Um, it's, it's Burmese for harm me and harm will come to you. Um, it's basically like a religious um, taboo that we've graffitied onto their shells. Um, and it has a few different reasons. One, anyone brave enough to touch that tortoise is gonna get some bad juju, um, for sure. 
Um, they're, they're very religious, and so it, it, it kind of, it has a very strong symbol. Um, but also, it's graffiti. And the reason those animals are exploited is for their shells, for their, their beauty, and we've taken that away. Um, and then on top of that, if they ever get confiscated, we know it's ours because nobody else is writing random Burmese symbols on the tortoises. Um, so that kind of um, you know, gave us a, a good little start with, with the star tortoises. And um, to kind of add on to that, we, we donate them to Buddhist monks. Um, they have a large, large amount of land in Myanmar. Um, and so they do a relig religious releasing ceremony, and they're blessing the tortoises. So yeah, if somebody's taking that tortoise, they are, they are just really, really brave. Um, so we, um, this is one of our, our newest releases in, in February of 2018. Uh, we've been releasing them since 2015. Um, so a little bit about our successes. I'll remind you, we started with 200 tortoises, um, confiscated adults. We've bred 15,000 in four assurance colonies. Um, we've released um, over 2,100 of those animals since 2015. Um, as those animals become large enough to be released because they're, they're a larger size to where they won't be predated, uh, we start to release them in the wild. And this little guy up here was the first offspring ever found in the wild um, since it's um, considered extinction in 2005. Uh, that animal was found in, in around 2017, and since then we've found about 40 offspring in our reintroduced areas. Um, so we were featured in the New York Times um, because it is um, an unusual story of success. Um, so many times we're reminded of how everything is going extinct, um, but this is working. Um, we've reintroduced animals, we're putting them back in the wild, and they're breeding. Um, so it is a program that is actually bringing a species back from extinction. So. Um, what we continue to see, though, is that species are still being lost, um, even through our efforts. So, for example, the Asian box turtles, um, they're the most endangered turtle group in the world because 92% of them are ranked as critically endangered. And the only other one that's not critically endangered is endangered. Um, several of them are extinct in the wild um, with only a handful of animals left. Um, and all species are still under intense collection pressure. So recognizing species like that still have an issue going on and, and, and we can't work with them necessarily in country, uh, we decided to start the Turtle Survival Center uh, right outside of Charleston, which is where I work. Um, and so it was just a goal to create assurance colonies for these endangered turtles that are, that are so near extinction. Um, and it was our single most ambitious undertaking. This is kind of a, just a, a map of, of some of the facilities we have currently. Um, and we're focusing on species that we can't conserve in range. That means we can't work with them in Vietnam, in China, in Madagascar, because they're not there anymore. Um, species that are also falling through the cracks. Um, you know, everybody likes to work with Galapagos tortoises. Other people don't necessarily like to work with some of the more drab, boring mud turtles or something like that. So we want to make sure that all turtles are getting kind of a fair shot at survival. Um, so things like the Asian box turtles were not being worked with very much, um, African hingebacks, um, and other Southeast Asian endemics. Um, and so that means that they're, they're endemic to that certain area or that certain country. A lot of these species only have a very small range, maybe even on one island, and that's it, or even a por portion of that island. Um, and so right now we're, we're impacting 21 species of critically endangered species at the center. So we base the collection plan on, on several different characteristics of can they live in South Carolina and thrive in captivity, um, and all of them are ranked critically endangered, and also um, species that are presenting specific husbandry challenges, like this, this big head turtle here um, is very difficult for zoos and aquariums to rear, so we're focusing on species like that. Um, and so we work with AZAs, uh, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, to kind of make this partnership. Um, we work with 17 um, tag-managed species, which is a taxon adva um, advisory group. Um, just another program for, for endangered species. Uh, we brought seven programs from red to yellow or yellow to green, and that's just statuses of endangerment. Green is good, red is bad. Um, and so we're continuing to bring species, elevating them to better stages of, of survival. Um, 
we're working on generations, um, the first generations as well, populations of those, and new species, species that don't get worked with with zoos and aquariums. Um, but we also became an AZA certified facility in 2018. That means we're a part of the Zoo and Aquarium Association. So we built um, a lot of enclosures in the first five years of, of existence. There was really nothing there short of like one building that could hold turtles. So what we do is basically take a greenhouse and turn it into turtle enclosures. Um, and we focus on natural enclosures, but um, of course, like if you build it, they will come, and, and we've quickly filled with numerous species. Um, 700 animals are at the center right now, um, and of course, they will also breed. Um, and so yeah, we have those naturalistic enclosures to provide a, a stress-free environment for the animals. Uh, we wanna basically make it like they're living in nature. Um, as naturalistic as possible, um, and they seem to enjoy it. Um, we also provide um, different native and culture, cultivated browse for them as well, just to kind of add to the um, experience for them, uh, to provide different food sources. Um, so we've been very successful so far. We've had 20 of the 30 species we have, um, and there's just a few of the different species, um, Asian box turtles, the African hingebacks, a pond turtle species, um, 10 other species. But the more important thing is that is 15 critically endangered species, and five of those are considered functionally extinct. Basically, they do not exist outside of captivity. And last year, we got 420 eggs. That's a lot of babies. Um, so wouldn't be a turtle talk without a bunch of cute turtle photos, especially baby turtles. Um, so here's some of the Asian box turtles, um, super cute. Um, and one species in particular is the South, Southern Vietnamese box turtle. Um, we hatched eight of those last year. We had 20 eggs. Um, fertility is increasing every year, um, but no zoo or aquarium has ever hatched this species. Um, it's a critically endangered species, obviously, but nowhere else is being successful like we are. Uh, we got more eggs in one breeding season than anywhere else in the world. Um, so there's still some hope. There's still you know, plenty of baby turtles um, being produced at this center. Um, and the partners are the keys to our success. Uh, we can't do this without all the partners that we have. Uh, we are heavily reliant on everyone kind of coming together for these turtles. We're, we're in 501c3, we don't charge at the door, we don't, we don't really make money on this. Um, it's totally about the turtles. So the partners are, are where it helps us to continue to do what we do. Um, and a big partner for us has been the museum. Um, they come down and get in the trenches with us. Um, they come volunteer, um, help us, you know, take care of the animals. Um, and it's just been a great partnership. Uh, we were fun featured in their, their Nature Connect magazine as well. Um, and it's, it's been a, a great partnership. And that's what we thrive on is these partnerships throughout the entire United States and the world to make sure that we can continue to do what we do. So. I just wanted to end on how you can make a difference. How can you can get involved with the Turtle Survival Alliance? Um, there's a bunch of different ways here. Um, just become a member. Uh, the membership gets you a magazine. It, it, you, you learn about what we're doing, but also it goes straight to conservation. Um, follow us on social media. Um, you know, Sponsor a species, small grants, donations, donations, donations. Um, you know, there's plenty of ways to get involved in turtle conservation. Um, we have a, a North American freshwater turtle research group as well. Um, we do samplings in Texas and Florida and, and, and throughout the eastern coast. Um, there's a lot of different ways to kind of get involved with turtle conservation. Um, so with that, that's about it. I'm going to open it up for kind of a more of a Q&A session and see what you guys think. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Yeah, we'll open it up to Q&A. That sounds like a good idea. Uh, if you've got a question for Nathan, wave your hand at me. And then I have a microphone, the way it'll work. I have a mic, Katie has a mic. We'll bring the microphones around to the room. So if we've not gotten to yet, just keep making eye contact and keep waving at us. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we have time for. And we've got a good lot of time. Let's have a good discussion. All right. So I'm wondering where turtles typically fit into their ecosystems? Like, 
what would be the implication, or what is the implication, when a turtle species becomes extinct in the wild? What is that, how does that affect the ecosystem there? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. Um, people don't really realize how important turtles are. Um, you know, one of the biggest things um, turtles are, are seed dispersal units. Um, they eat fruit and other seeds that they move through the river, they move through the desert, they move through all these environments and spread those seeds around. Um, another um, impact that they have is that they are kind of the, the natural decomposers, especially in river systems. Um, you have these scavengers that basically help break down and recycle the nutrients. Um, they're also a significant food source. Um, so you have a perfect example of sea turtles emerging or other um, riverine species that emerge all at once. Um, there's hundreds or even thousands of hatchlings that emerge at once. Um, and that's done specifically because they're a food source for everything. Everything eats a little baby turtle. It's bite-sized. It's like popcorn shrimp, right? And they're just picking them up. Um, but it's the numbers that is the real name of the game. If they only laid a few eggs, they wouldn't be that food source. Um, they'd be a little more susceptible. Now, some species do lay you know, just a few eggs, but they fit a different niche. Um, so they have a lot of different roles throughout the entire world, um, you know, whether it be, you know, scavengers, seed dispersals, um, even just um, changing the landscape. Um, the giant tortoises of Galapagos were the elephants of Asia. Um, they helped to sculpt the landscape, um, Maldives the same way, several other areas where large tortoises were found, but no other larger megafauna were found. They helped to change and sculpt the landscape. So they have a lot of impacts um, that, that people don't really realize um, what they do because they're just kind of this, um, I don't know, not, not in your face as much. Yeah. Yeah. Who's got the next one? There's one next to you, Katie. Uh, I'm new here. He's new here. Yeah, yeah. So um, you used the term browse, and um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that everyone's familiar with that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about browse and why it's important, uh, especially in animals in captivity. Yeah, so um, there's been a huge shift in um, turtle and especially tortoise um, captivity and rearing. Um, we buy kind of a supermarket diet. Um, but in the wild, the majority of those things don't occur. Those animals aren't eating, naturally eating lettuce, naturally eating zucchini or tomatoes. Um, and so what we try and do at the center is provide um, the natural vegetation that they would normally be eating. Leaves, grasses, even native fruits, um, and other things that way they would normally be eating to kind of help simulate their wild environment. And so if we don't do that, um, they don't necessarily get the same amount of nutrients as they would from just a, a normal, you know, store-bought lettuce, tomato mix. Um, and so we try and provide them a, a diversified diet, and that helps their overall health and well-being. Uh, it also kind of adds um, enrichment to the enclosures and for the animals because they're going around and eating, you know, hibiscus flowers that are hanging down or, or leaves that have just draped perfectly into their enclosure or we've, you know, cut and fed out. And, and so that kind of keeps, keeps them engaged as well and not just a, you know, a boring life. Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, so working here in the museum like I do, I, we have a few turtles on exhibit, live turtles that I can go spend time with. So I can go hang out with turtles. That's amazing. But I don't have to take care of the turtles. I just get to be with them. So what happens in the day of a life of a turtle keeper? Is it as much fun to be around the turtles as I'm having? Or is it a lot of work? Good work. It, it is very rewarding work. Um, but it's a lot of hard work. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, it's kind of funny that they, they they think, oh, you have such an awesome job. You get to play with turtles every day. I'm like, well, no, I get to change their water and feed them. But um, it, it's, it's still a, a very rewarding job. Um, it's very a whole lot of work. Um, like you said, a 40-hour work week. Uh, we don't really understand what that means. Uh, that's, a, that's a foreign concept for us, uh, especially a nonprofit. We're there for the turtles, and we're there 24 hours a day. Um, we live on site. 
Um, if something happens in the middle of the night, guess what? I'm rolling out of bed and going to see what's going on. So it's a lot of work, but it is meaningful work. So uh, what species would you say is the most challenging that you've worked with uh, at the facility? Um, let's see. Um, you know, there, there's so many that, that provide their own unique challenges. Um, I would say that um, probably some of the Asian box turtles have been some of the most challenging because um, we don't know anything about them. Um, so those, those Asian box turtles in the genus Cora, where I showed that they were the most endangered group, um, very little is known about their natural history at all. Uh, one species we've never found it in the wild. We have no idea where it comes from other than China. Uh, another species that's only been found, basically um, it, its habitat has been found once by biologists. Um, and no natural history is known of these species. So that makes it really challenging in a captive setting to be able to provide what these animals need. Um, and so that, I think, is, is the most challenging part, is, is trying to figure it out and, and know what works and, and how to replicate something because we know nothing about the animal. So I, I'm amazed at what you have to know to do this work. So you're talking about species and where they live and also the people who are there with possibly farms they can live on. And I'm wondering how this body of knowledge was amassed and over how long a time and who did it. And then I'm also really curious if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing how you got into this profession a little bit. So the, the body of knowledge is a difficult one. Um, we, um, there's not a lot of published literature about the animals. Um, and also every country is so different and difficult to work in. Um, from Belize to Cambodia to Madagascar, every single one of them poses difficult challenges, not only for the animals, but, but for the overall logistics of doing something like that in each one of those countries. Um, it's taken a long time, for sure. Um, unfortunately, still a lot of it's up here for a lot of us, um, but there's still such a good network, and it's a close turtle family of conservationists that we we work together we know everybody and every player and you know there's somebody that's been through it before you know that it's not the first time that 10,000 animals has been confiscated and we can pull on those resources and we can come together as people passionate about turtle conservation to help tackle that problem um, how I got into it um, I've always been kind of a, a reptile and amphibian person. Um, I, I caught salamanders and snakes growing up. Um, as I progressed, I, I went to college and, and, and got some degrees in wildlife. Um, but I, I got into the zoo field, um, and that was where I really saw um, a difference being made in conservation, um, where I could impact a species or a group of species and and it really doesn't take a whole lot to change the outcome of these species. It just takes caring people that, that want to dedicate their lives to it. Um, I wanted to do something more, um, and that was what the zoos and aquariums were doing, is basically taking these species that you know most people may not even know exist or even really care about, but fighting for them to exist with us. Um, you know, turtles have existed for 300 million years, um, and, and human beings are the ones that are driving extinction. Yeah. Hi. Um, some exotic snake species have been introduced, unfortunately, into America and made, um, have established colonies. Have any um, of the turtles established colonies here in America? Um, it's really the inverse. Um, so the worst one is uh, red ear sliders. A lot of us have red ear sliders as pets growing up, or you see them in the markets. Um, that is the species of turtle that has been found on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, when you go to a temple pond in India and seeing, you know, critically endangered, you know, tent tortoise, or tent turtles, there's a red ear slider beside them. 
when you're, you know, in Cambodia, you know, looking, you know, for turtles and you go to the markets, there's red ear sliders in the markets. Um, that is an example of where they have kind of spread throughout. Um, you know, I can't think of an exotic species of turtle that has been introduced in the United States and has any type of um, impact at all. Um, and I think that's because of the continued demand for turtles. Um, you know, turtles are eaten in this country, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, around the world, turtles are consumed. Um, and, and that consumption continues to grow to this day as human population increases. So I really can't think of a species off the top of my head that has been introduced. Um, I'm sure there are some in Florida um, that have had you know, some minor um, introduction issues, but nothing like snakes or lizard species in Florida that are running rampant. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned population increase. Um, in the spirit of climate change, what kinds of impacts have you seen, um, even counterintuitive impacts, have you seen um, have any kind of effect on the turtles? So the most direct one, um, so for turtle biology, a lot of species are, um, the sex is determined based on the temperature of the nest, um, and so, what we're seeing now is, um, and it's oftentimes warmer means more females, and colder means more males. Um, and that is having some effects on some species. It's been documented. Um, and it's not necessarily just due to climate change, but also habitat alteration, where there's no natural cover where the animals would normally nest. There's no protection for the eggs. They're, they're you know, elevated temperature. Um, so that, that has been documented. And I would say that's probably the most um, drastic climate change impact, because you have to have both. <laughs> um, and the warmer we get, the less likely that's going to be for some species. Hi, I wanted to know um, how you, your organization keeps track of the endangered species, kind of how it goes from the status of red to yellow to green, and even how you find these locations that have 10,000 turtles in there as well. I mean, how, how do you find those, and how do you keep track of all these endangered species out there of turtles? So there is, um, the IUCN um, is the, it's basically a group of scientists that come together to rank every species in the world. Um, and there's a specific portion of that, which is the turtle and freshwater tortoise specialist group. Um, and those people rank these species frequently um, based on the knowledge of every turtle scientist. You know, we have people in Vietnam working with that species, and they say they can't find them anymore. There's people in the Philippines saying they can't find it. So that's what bumps them up. Um, you know, we're taking census of those species and working with those, you know, on a regular basis. So with that assessment regularly, those species get elevated or lowered based on, um, you know, where, what we see in the wild. Um, the red, yellow, and green refers to populations in zoos and aquariums. Um, and so stud books have basically three levels. Red is the most threatened um, to extinction, and green is considered safe. Um, and so that has to do with the numbers in captivity. So if we um, breed more animals, we can bring those num or those colors basically from red to yellow or yellow to green based on our efforts. Um, as far as the seizures, um, that's a lot of government officials. Um, so they get the tip-offs. Um, they catch them at the airport. They, you know, get reports. Um, and then we work in those countries and they talk with us. We have either um, people that are locally, we, we only employ native people in those countries. So in Madagascar, we have Malagasy people working for turtle conservation. Um, and so they are working with the government, and when they have a seizure like that, they have to find somebody to do it. Uh, it's a huge burden on them, so they come to us. Um, so usually we have that kind of network close enough to where, you know, if it's a decent seizure, you know, most government organizations don't have any type of capacity to handle those. Yep. For turtles that you know very little about their natural habitat, 
how do you establish what conditions they need to thrive in and particularly to reproduce in? That's definitely why they're the most challenging. What we can do is um, we do know about similar species. Um, and there are comparisons that can be made even with you know, similar genera, you know, pond turtles with pond turtles, box turtles with box turtles. We can make some references, but some of it's just luck of the draw. Some of it's just trying to figure out and taking years, talking with other people that have done the same thing, having that collaborative partnership again and coming together and saying, okay, here's what's worked and here's what hasn't worked and trying to just try new things sometimes. Um, you know, that, that box turtle that I showed that we're very successful with and no zoo is bred, nobody knew because they considered them a very similar species to other box turtles, nobody knew that they couldn't tolerate temperatures below 55 degrees to reproduce. They can live in temperatures below 55 degrees, but it seems that it kills the sperm. No fertile eggs were ever produced. We stopped keeping them in that temperature, we were successful. And that was from collaborations with European people that are also successfully breeding those species and they have to keep them indoors because in Austria it's cold and they can't keep them outside so they have to keep them warm. They started seeing that this is working for them. We put two and two together and that's you know what triggered it. So um, it's really just working together and trying to come up with you know a collaboration on what's not working and what has. I know that despite uh, humans accelerating it, extinction is a natural process. So at what point do you realize that turtle, a turtle species has gone past the point of saving and how do you use that to change your mind about what turtle species you might be working with? So the only turtle species for us that have gone beyond the point of saving are the ones that are extinct. Um, I don't think people realize the numbers that we work in. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, there is a giant soft shell in Vietnam um, and there's only five known individuals. We've got to do something. We can't just watch this species, this giant soft turtle, turtle go extinct. Um, so we do artificial insemination. We try and do eDNA surveys to determine if it's in the environment in other areas. We try everything we can because that's our mission for zero turtle extinctions and we won't stop until it's extinct. And we try and do everything we can to fight that. Um, and some of the animals that we have at the center, there may be 50 or 100 animals left in the world. Um, it's just an, it's a, it's a concept that we have to deal with, but there's no reason why we can't change that. Uh, hi. Um, I know when you uh, find box turtles, like on the road, if you put them on the wrong side, they'll just turn around and walk past the road. Uh, do you have any trouble like releasing turtles that uh, just walk right back into danger or anything? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a scenario we've perfected based on really generations of reintroductions. Um, it was based initially on gopher tortoise studies that were done in the southeast. Uh, and what, what they found worked best was what we call a soft release. You basically take a large acreage and fence it in. Maybe a half acre, maybe an acre or so, but you fence it in and you keep the turtles in there and one day you open the doors and you let them decide to leave. Yeah, if you take that animal and put it here, it's gonna wanna go right back here where it was. But if it decided, oh hey, the door's open, I'm gonna go out. That's completely different. And, and that was something that wasn't really known 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and so what you do the same thing in Myanmar um, when we introduce those Burmese star tortoises, we'll basically fence in a perimeter of protected land. We leave them there for about six months, and then one day we open up like three doors and let them go. Yeah. And that seems to work a lot better than trying to force them to be somewhere that they're not used to because they have a, a general sense of just homing back to where they were. Uh, I wonder if you would <clears throat> discuss the maximum a lifespan of different species of turtles? Um, so some of it we really don't know a maximum lifehood yet because we haven't been recording history long enough. Um, the longest record is roughly 186 to 192 years. And that's because we really haven't been recording history much longer than that, especially for tortoises living. Um, so 
we don't really have a good understanding of that yet. Um, and especially because many of these species are so poorly known and poorly studied. Um, what we do find is, you know, the average lifespan of, of Native American turtles, um, or, you know, box turtles are roughly 30 years. Snappers can be, you know, 50, 80, but we really still don't know because you can find um, alligator snapping turtles with um, Civil War bullets in them to this day. Um, they have literally been x-rayed and have musket balls in their shell, um, you know, in their, you know, um, salomic cavity. So we really just don't know enough about turtles um, and, and each one of them is so different and so unique. Um, you can make some generalities, you know, box turtles probably live 30, 40 years. You know, more tortoises seem to be a longer lived species. Um, but then you get those denizens of the deep, like alligator snappers, or even, you know, green sea turtles or other sea turtles that we really haven't studied enough long enough. Um, we just don't know enough about them. We have no idea where green sea turtles go for the first 20 years of their life. They just and we see them in 20 or 30 years again when they come back to nest. Yeah. Over here. Woof, woof. Oh, yep. Okay. Hi, one more. Um, what kind of mutualistic relationships do turtle species have? Um, are there any animal plants or, or fungi species that uh, help the vitalization of turtle species? So I think the best example would really be the gopher tortoise um, because of the other species that live with and within gopher tortoise burrows. So gopher tortoise lives in the southeastern United States. Um, there's a similar species, the desert tortoise, that lives out west, um, several species of de desert tortoise. But um, they create these big burrows in the landscape. Everything uses those burrows. Out west, it's, it's burrowing owls that live in there. Um, here, it may be indigo snakes. There's rattlesnakes. There's frogs. There's um, you know kangaroo rats out west. There's all these other species that without those you know, terraformers, they, they can't survive. A kangaroo rat cannot dig a burrow well. You know, um, an indigo snake can burrow a little bit, but not as well as, as a gopher tortoise. Um, so you get those kind of, of, of um, symbiotic relationships. It doesn't necessarily benefit the tortoise, um, except for when the diamondback's up front. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really change their lives as much, but it does change the lives of all the other species around them. Does that answer your question? So I'm curious as to what your favorite species is to work with and why. Oh, okay. My favorite, um, I can go back a couple slides because it's here. I try and throw it in. It's that species right in the middle. It's the big-headed turtle. Um, that's a bunch of babies. Um, they are um, so unique. They're in their own family. Um, they're an ancient turtle species. Um, they come from cold mountain streams from China all the way down through to Myanmar. Um, and they're just about one of the coolest turtles you can have. Um, they're just, they're very unique. Um, they can be grumpy, um, but they are just beautiful animals. Yeah, so that's, that's my favorite. Yeah. We've got time for a couple more, I think. And, oh, I see, oh, there's a lot more, okay. Um, we're so used to being disheartened by how much a lot of the environmental protections in our country have been are being dismantled and um, so it's kind of amazing to see in these other countries that they're actually confiscating illegal illegally captured turtles and so you said it was difficult in these different countries but in general are governments cooperative and encouraging the work you're doing and along the same line what about china if so much of the turtles so many of the turtles are going to china is the chinese government helpful at all in this so it's another one of those um individual case basis um i would say that some of the countries are fantastic to work with Myanmar has been incredibly receptive. The government has been so helpful and forthcoming. We have 100 people working for us through the government and other agencies part of the Myanmar government. Um, it's been an amazing cooperation. Um, China is an impenetrable fortress. 
um, they have this like wall put up, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, and it's very difficult to work in that country so far. We've not been able to penetrate it. Um, we're still working, we're still trying, and there is some, some you know, good studies coming abroad. And there's also a lot of Chinese scientists doing good work. Um, but I wouldn't say that the Chinese government has embraced any sort of, of regulations or, or kind of, um, you know, anywhere near as cooperative as many of the other governments that we work with. Hey, when you're reintroducing some of these turtles, like considering your favorite one here, you know, from Eastern Asia, are you reintroducing them, these exotic species, domestically here in the U.S., or are you creating programs to bring them back to their native land? Yeah, so we don't release anything where it wasn't found. Um, basically, we are, if we can, work in that country of origin and where they are already found or were found. Um, and if not, we work with them in the United States with the eventuality of their offspring's offspring. Once culture changes, once laws change, et cetera, the habitat's protected, those animals go back where they belong. Um, and so that's kind of part of the Turtle Survival Alliance's or the Turtle Survival Center's goal is that these animals will eventually be able to put, be put back where they belong. Um, it may be 10 years, it may be 100 years. And depending on the species, some of those are closer than others, um, but the goal is to put them back where they were. Yes, I was just wondering, is your facility open to visitors? So we are not open to the public. Um, we are basically just operating as um, a, a backup for zoos and aquariums, really. Um, so we're not really staffed well enough. Um, and we don't even really meet some of the permitting and stuff that would be required to be a general open to the public, you know, accessible place. Yeah. Sorry. I assume you have a much higher density of turtles than would be found in the wild in a particular area. Do they show signs of stress from, you know, too many like rats do when you get too many in an, in an environment? So we try and mimic as much of the natural density as we can. Um, we don't have an overcrowding issue in, in the Turtle Survival Center, but um, in those areas like Madagascar is a perfect example where the density is definitely higher. Um, we try and mitigate it as much as we can, and, and there's easy things that we can do, such as plenty of visual barriers, shade structures, you know, numerous feeding spots so they don't have to all compete for one food source, et cetera. You can do a lot of stuff to help combat any of those stressors that might have an issue. Um, we have to, you know, kind of look at the species as well. Tortoises are a lot easier to keep in larger numbers without aggression. Um, those big-headed turtles, you keep them individually. They're from their solitary animals from rivers. They don't see any other animals except for to breed. And when you put them together, that's the only thing they want to do. And you better get them out quick. Um, so it's, it's depending on the species and how we have to manage them. Um, but each one of those is, is a little different. Um, and some of those can be, you know, higher densities, especially with, you know, riverine turtles or, or tortoises. So it's a little easier sometimes. Let's give Nathan another round of applause. Thank you very much, guys. Awesome job. Hey, another thing, real quick. Uh, we have a number of the animal care staff from here in the museum, some of whom were featured in this slideshow because they've done work with TSA. Where are you? Wave at us, everybody. Phil, Kurt, Bob, Dan, and the team, Josh. We. So I'm glad you like spent the day with, with our folks. So I'm glad that the museum made it into your slideshow. That, that felt good. And, and I, I'm sure it felt good for them that we can be a part of all this great work. Now, uh, on to the finale with living poetry. I'm going to invite them up to the stage and pass off a microphone. And we'll enjoy a little art with our science tonight. Thank you, everybody. My name is Bartholomew Barker. I'm one of the organizers of Living Poetry. We're the largest group of poets and poetry readers in the Triangle. You should uh, join us if you have any interest at all in poetry. We run monthly workshops. 
We list all the open mics in the area, and we do fun stuff like this. I have with me Tara Lynn Groth, Dan Bowl, and Anna Weaver. So I'll read my poem first, obviously. Imagine your whole species piled in the back of a truck. It really isn't hard. With the storms and seas ravaging our cities, what if our only hope arrives from interstellar space, orbiting our fevered planet in ships they carry on their own backs, arriving to save us from our own excesses? Harm anyone, and harm comes to us all, because we're all turtles all the way down. Yeah, I'm Tara Lynn Groth. I'm a writer um, from Pittsburgh and also a co-organizer of Living Poetry and wanted to let you know that um, we are having our 10th anniversary party at the North Carolina Botanical Gardens in two weeks. It's a free celebration, so definitely check out livingpoetry.net and um, join the group to get the details. This poem is Soft Release. The wind's wild handshake and sun's warm hug race to meet me. I stretch my neck and pull back, trust flees me. Freedom feels false from friends thrown away. How can this be? Everyone traded for a trick except me. Then my, shells, then my shell tattoos juju bleeds through. I'm ready for this soft release. Hey guys, my name is Dan. Uh, this one's called Totally About Turtles. It's easier for a turtle to pass through a plastic ring than two kids to stay in the same shirt. Pet trade, food trade, climate change. Look forward to that as well. Here's a joke. Why did the turtle cross the road? Somebody's dad. Turtle Survival Alliance, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, suited up to take a closer look. Burmese star tortoise back from the dead. Beep, 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 beep. Radio color, beep, 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 beep. That's bad juju. Everything is going extinct. Graffiti, this is working. Galapagos turtles are sexy. Check it out. It's called ecotourism. Question, who here can live in South Carolina? Wait, bear with me. You get a greenhouse, plants, water. There's a huge menu. They love it. Lots of babies. During a nature walk, a kid said to me, my dad saved a turtle from the road. Your dad and everybody else here, kid. My name is Anna Weaver. I'm a poet from Cary. I may be small, Turtle says, slowly. I may be handsome and easy to catch. I may seem shy, but fear me. I am numbered and marked. See my day glow pink and know that I am tagged like a boxcar carrying something you do not know you need. Something so rare that I am blessed by your holy men and known to scientists who do not mess around. Who are bent on knowing me. Who would follow me out to sea and underground. Who are working faster than my death and hatching hope by the truckload. Thank you all very much. Oh gosh, there's poetry all over the place. What'd y'all think of that show? I got a thumbs up in the back, yeah. Nathan, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out tonight, all the way from South Carolina to come up here and share your work with us at the Turtle Survival Center. Yeah, everybody, go check out what they're doing, check out what we're doing. There's cool stuff happening here at the museum and all over the world and that we have connections to from right here in the Triangle. So I'm so glad that you all came out and were a part of tonight's program. Uh, do know, I want to let everybody know, uh, 
we do this every Thursday night, right? But we also archive the show because we broadcast live on the Facebook and YouTube. So you can go back to the museum's channels and watch just about any science cafe that's happened in this space. We've got topics across all disciplines of science. So if you want to learn something else and it's not Thursday at 7 o'clock, go check out the museum's social media accounts. You can go back in time and learn a lot that's going on right here. We'll be back here next Thursday night. Next Thursday night is the first Thursday night of the month, so that means science trivia night. Three rounds of science trivia. Bring your team, compete for prizes. It's going to be a lot of fun. I will be your quiz master next week. I apologize in advance. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Come out and be a part of that. And I hope we'll see you again here soon at the Science Cafe. Good night, everybody.